as we continue to piece together the days leading up to this just horrible tragedy. <laughs> Sorry, Gina, you know, so many people have just cannot believe the details of what we've been telling you for the last two days. In a chilling and haunting tale that shook the community, Blair Stockdale, a young mother, committed an unimaginable act that left a lasting scar. She claimed that she did what she did because demons were trying to harm her through her cats. Huh? It all goes back to a tragic day on September the 20th, 2010 in California. An apartment located in 1300 block of Saratoga Avenue in Ventura became the scene of a chilling discovery. A young woman, Blair Stockadil, only 25 and a mother, was caught up in some unimaginable chaos. The locals made panicked calls to 911 after hearing this gut-wrenching scream, she is dead. It was like a nightmare coming alive right in the middle of the day. Now when the cops got there around 11.30 in the morning, they found this scene straight out of a horror movie. A man with badly injured arms and Blair herself holding a knife of all things. But as bad as all that was, the real shock came later. The cops went inside her condo and found a poor little girl, Blair's eight-year-old daughter, who had been dead for days. The cops hauled Blair off to the Ventura County Jail and charged her with the whole terrible scene. And here's the kicker. Blair had just got back legal custody of her daughter. Less than a month before her life was cruelly cut short, Elena had been the subject of abuse allegations. Both the cops and the social workers had stepped in, but their prying eyes found nothing amiss. They had said she wasn't in danger. Even the child welfare records painted a haunting portrait of Blair, a mentally ill woman who had lost custody of Elena five years before. But life has a funny way of turning things around, doesn't it? Blair clawed her way back, regaining custody of Elena in December 2009. Fast forward nine months and we have this horror story. Elena was found lifeless in the bathtub of Blair's Ventura apartment. In the wake of the catastrophe, the cops and county officials looked through their actions with a fine tooth comb. Let's recall a particular day on August the 25th. On this day, the Ventura police showed up at the doorstep following a worrying allegation that Elena had spilled a scary secret to a neighbor that her mother had choked her. Now this is where it gets murky. According to Ventura police, Commander Mark Stadler, the complaint was a game of whispers. The informant was Stockdale's ex-boyfriend who claimed that a neighbor had informed him about the choking incident. The weird part, this neighbor never bothered to have a chat with the cop themselves so you see, it was a mess of he said, she said. Undeterred, the police did their bit, paying a visit to the Stockdale residence. There, they had a chat with both Blair and Elena separately, of course. But shockingly, they couldn't find a shred of evidence to back the choking claim. There were no signs of physical injury on Elena, and the little girl even denied being abused. Now, the very next day, another curveball was thrown. This time, an anonymous tipster called the county's Child Protective Services unit claiming that Elena was a victim of abuse and neglect. The allegations echoed the previous day's choking claim, but there was more. The faceless caller painted a grim picture speaking of Elena being unsupervised, undurfed and living in a dirty bedroom. The anonymous voice on the other end of the line did not stop there though. They painted Blair as a woman fighting against bipolar disorder and prone to psychotic episodes. Worse yet, they claimed she had ditched her prescribed medication and was dabbling in methamphetamine instead. And then came the whirlwind of efforts by social workers to pin down Blair 
and Elena. It was like chasing shadows. They'd visit the home over and over, only to be met by a vacant residence. Blair always managed to call back, playing cat and mouse with the system, even going as far as to set up a meeting for the next day. But wouldn't you know it, she was a no-show when the social workers arrived. It got to the point where a social worker had to dial up the police on September the 2nd just to check if a report had been filed. An officer called back the same day, painting a relatively cosy picture. The fridge was well stocked and the apartment seemed safe enough. Even Blair's mental health, while definitely not ideal, did not appear to be standing in the way of her caring for Elena. Or so he believed. The officer didn't think it necessary for the CPS to have another chat with Elena since the police felt they'd pretty much covered all the bases. So on one of the subsequent days, social workers paid another visit to the Stockdale residence. It was a tidy and secure, a picture of domestic tranquility. And there was Elena, cosy in her footed pyjamas, not exhibiting any telltale signs of fear. Blair, on the other hand, was like a fortress, keeping her guard up. She flat out denied any drug usage or laying a hand on Elena for discipline. Her answers were curt, mostly yes or no, and any discussions about mental health were a big no-no. In spite of her walls, the social worker found Blair capable of parenting. The allegations of neglect and abuse were deemed groundless, and on September the 8th, they closed the case, which later they would of course regret. As in a heart-stopping twist, Elena was discovered lifeless just 12 days later. I'm not going to go on to the history of Blair, but before I continue, if you look at the scenario, the police went over, a social worker went over, they didn't see anything alarming, right? That's not an excuse, because it's your job to find the alarm, metaphorically speaking. Stepping back to 2003, when Blair was 17, she spent three weeks in a mental hospital. Elena was barely a year old. That to me, is a trigger. Do you think she was suffering from postpartum? Maybe. Post her stint in the hospital, Blair confided to a social worker that she had been admitted because she had been screaming at the top of her lungs in tongues. She recalled an unsettling incident where she held Elena in a way that triggered police involvement. Blair had stated that she held her calves and put her upside down because there were evil spirits in her. Following Blair's release from the hospital, Elena seemed to be adjusting quite nicely as per a report. Mother and daughter made their home at Blair's father's place in Ventura, but any semblance of normalcy did not last long. Within a fortnight of Blair's hospital release, by July the 30th, another complaint rolled in, accusing Blair of displaying erratic, out-of-touch-with-reality behaviour. How many complaints do you want before you need to act? A social worker's assessment showed Elena appearing healthy, though her clothes were a bit grubby. Blair, on the other hand, was a brick wall, insisting she was not crazy and flatly refusing to delve into her health matters. As we move into August 2003, social workers were advising that family members take over Elena's guardianship. Despite fielding complaints of neglect and emotional abuse thrice that summer, they couldn't corroborate them. By the summer of 2005, we were looking at a powder keg situation. Unpredictable antics marked Blair's behavior. One June incident, the police found Elena, just three then, left unattended in a car while Blair was visiting a friend. How's a child unattended? This is either two things happened here. Number one, she thought, well, let me leave the child in the car. I'll quickly run in, get what I need to, I'll come back out, right? Or she just forgot. What the hell? A couple of months later, Blair was seen disposing of her furniture on the lawn, stating she had no place to stash her belongings. Okay, that's quite weird. After being directed towards several resources, including a psychiatrist, Blair was urged by a social worker to resume her medication. This time around, the social worker substantiated neglect and urged the grandfather to immediately assume Elena's guardianship. In the subsequent years, it seemed like Blair and Elena found their footing. Post two unsubstantiated neglect complaints in 2007, CPS records show no further contact with the family. Blair moved out of her father's place in the same year, taking Elena with her and successfully petitioned to regain legal custody 
in December of 2009. On October the 12th, 2010, some gut-wrenching details about Elena's tragic end started surfacing from the autopsy report and the ensuing investigation by the Ventura County Medical Examiner's Office. The grim discovery of Elena's lifeless body was made by John Kimmis, who was Blair's occasional boyfriend. He had to force his way into the apartment and the horrific reality unfolded. Neighbours recalled that they heard a cat crying relentlessly all night outside Stockdale's residence and someone supposedly called Kimmis. Things took a bloody turn between Stockdale and Kimmis. A fight ensued. Kimmis was reportedly stabbed and police were summoned to intervene. Later, however, it was concluded that Kimmis was a witness rather than a victim given the minor nature of his injuries. On entering the apartment, the authorities were met with the chaotic scene. Evidence of a struggle was abundant. Blood droplets shattered windows, papers strewn around, and all pointed towards a violent altercation between Stockdale and Kimmis. In the bathroom, the horrifying sight of Elena greeted them. Her lifeless body laid sideways in the barren bathtub. Face turned towards the wall, her head rested on a small pillow, and a soaked towel beneath her torso. Her left arm was wrapped around her torso and her right hand partially tucked under the pillow. Her body was bare, except for a towel covering her feet and the majority of her legs. The autopsy report painted a picture of a seemingly well-nourished girl at 4 foot 2 tall and weighing around 55 pounds. Signs of water immersion were evident on her hands and feet and fluid was found in her lungs, along with blood congestion in her organs. Dr. Janice Frank, the chief medical examiner, remarked that the condition of Elena's body suggested that she had been dead for a few days. Although the exact timeline remained uncertain since no reliable account of when the girl was last seen alive was available. So Blair was in her house with her daughter dead for a few days? Was she really mentally ill? Who knows? Elena was last seen at Elmhurst School on September the 15th with her mother informing the school the following day that Elena was unwell and wouldn't be attending. Stockdale did reveal that an incident occurred while she was bathing with Elena the week prior to the dreadful discovery but she didn't give any specific details at the time. The autopsy report showed no external injury or trauma on Elena's body. There was a small bruise on her head but it wasn't clear when or how she sustained it and it wasn't considered significant. The reports concluded Elena's cause of death as drowning and marked it as a homicide. Blair Stockdale's prolonged struggle with bipolar disorder was well known and it was in 2005 that her father Michael Stockdale took custody of Elena as per relatives and court records. However, in December 2009, she regained full custody of her daughter after living with Elena for about two years. Following Elena's death, Michael Stockdale had suspicions that his daughter might have stopped taking her medication. During a visit on September the 13th, he accompanied his daughter to fetch her medication. The police and protective services had investigated allegations of Blair choking her daughter weeks before Elena's death, but they found no evidence of such abuse. Blair Stockdale's father even went on record saying that he had never seen his daughter getting physical with Elena. Her way of discipline was putting Elena in time out for any misbehavior. We fast forward to February the 7th, 2012, in a packed courtroom at the Ventura County Superior Court. Blair Stockdale, the woman under the spotlight for the horrifying drowning of her daughter, made a shocking change to her plea. Initially, she pled not guilty through her attorney Donna Forey. But then they switched her plea to not guilty by reason of insanity. A pretty big shift, wouldn't you say? Judge Kevin McGee then made a move to get to the bottom of Stockdale's mental state, appointing psychologists John Lewis and Lauren Thomas to carry out a thorough mental health evaluation. The prosecutor, Christina Jensen, laid it out plainly for Stockdale who stood by her lawyer. Prosecutor told her, that if she was found not guilty by reason of insanity, she could be looking at spending the rest of her life in a mental institution. Stockdale said, yeah, I understand what you're saying. At the time, Stockdale was held in jail with the bail set at a steep 
$530,000. The court was scheduled to reconvene on May the 9th, awaiting the outcome of the psychologist's assessments. Donna Forey, representing Stockdale from the Public Defender's Office, decided to keep her comments to herself. In a later interview, Jensen revealed that Stockdale was being charged with first-degree murder and child abuse. However, she warned against jumping to the idea of a trial, emphasizing that the priority was the evaluation of Stockdale's mental health. You see, when a plea of not guilty by reason of insanity is raised, the prosecution's task is to first convince the jury that the defendant did indeed commit the crime. If the defendant is found guilty, the jury then has to figure out if the defendant was insane when the crime happened. Jensen spelled out the consequences for Stockdale. If she is found guilty and the jurors conclude she was sane at the time of the crime, she could face a sentence ranging from 29 years to life in prison. And then, on December the 14th, 2012, Blair Stockdale pled guilty to first-degree murder by reason of insanity in the Ventura Superior Court. Christina Jensen, the prosecutor, shed some light on the circumstances, saying that Stockdale, a woman with a substantial history of mental illness, would be facing a sentence of 25 years to life. But instead of a conventional prison, she would serve her time in a secure state mental facility. The presiding judge, Charles Campbell, of the Ventura County Superior Court, confirmed that Stockdale had entered her guilty plea voluntarily and intelligently. Flanked by her lawyer, Donna Forey, from the Public Defender's Office, the 27-year-old Stockdale appeared in court dressed in blue and orange jail attire and shackles. She responded to the judge's questions in a low, calm voice, confirming that she understood the constitutional rights she was giving up by pleading guilty. Throughout the proceedings, Stockdale intermittently consulted Forey, a move encouraged by Judge Campbell. Jensen noted that it was an uncommon occurrence for the district attorney's office to concur with the claim of insanity at the time of the crime. However, in Stockdale's case, the multitude of facts and substantial mental health records indicating her legal insanity were too compelling to ignore. According to Jensen, Stockdale's struggle with mental issues goes back to her teenage years. She also revealed that Stockdale held the belief that demons were plotting to harm her through her daughter and her cats. It was decided to disclose several details of this heartrending case to the public due to its profoundly tragic and traumatic nature. Despite the possibility that psychiatrists might one day declare her mentally well, leading to a potential release back into the community with mental health support. Jensen considered this unlikely. Reminiscing the grisly discovery in September 2010, Jensen recounted that Stockdale had placed a pink silk satin pillow underneath her head in the tub and had been running warm water over her body in the hopes that if she kept Elena warm, Elena could come back. That's creepy. Behind this horrifying act, Blair was tormented by her belief that demons were out to get her, using her pets and her beloved daughter as conduits. A belief so entrenched in her psyche, it drove her to commit an unthinkable crime. Senior Deputy District Attorney Christina Jensen recalled this case as the first and only one where she agreed to let a defendant plead guilty by reason of insanity. They believed there was a level of mental impairment Blair was dealing with. Judge Campbell echoed the sentiment, acknowledging the gravity of the situation and voicing hope for a day when Blair might be reintegrated into society. But the only viable course of action was to confine her to Patton State Hospital and Blair was handed down a sentence of 25 years to life for the first degree murder of her 8 year old daughter. To be fair, if the prosecutors are like, yeah, she's insane, and if the judge is like, yeah, she's insane, my guess would be she's probably insane. I say that because how many true crime cases do suspects claim insanity because they feel they can get away with it, while the prosecutors do whatever they can to ensure that claim is ignored? Therefore, for the prosecutors to say, yeah, sorry mate, but yeah, you are insane, I'm likely to believe it. I mean, even this idea that she put a pink pillow in the bathtub to try and revive her daughter to come back, that's actually kind of chilling, kind of weird. If we take all of this at face value, then it's just a series of unfortunate events. But the question remains, where was the father? Not Blair's father, the child's father. 
a lack of support system is probably one of the reasons why she suffered from postpartum. That would be my guess. Uh, there's no confirmation she had postpartum, but that would be my guess. But for me, the insanity plea and the judge agreeing, this is one of the few cases where I think, yeah, probably was the right outcome. Comment, tell me what you think.